we've got a lot to cover today and we're going to jump right in. And this is probably a little bit different than the format that you might be expecting if you've done these before. Um, so it's designed to be sort of interactive and engaging in some new ways. Um, and uh, we've got a lot to cover, like I said, so we're just going to jump in. But I'm going to start off with just kind of briefly introducing myself, telling a little bit of my story, my background, so that we can understand how, how we got here. And then we're going to actually uh, allow for you to use some of these uh, AI enabled products that we're developing uh, in this actual session. So it's going to help you have a really tangible sort of takeaway uh, today to be able to have said, okay, I'm, I've used this stuff and I understand what's happening in this space. And I promise you right now that it's not what you're expecting. Um, I think that's one of the sort of things that I'm most excited about in this presentation today and in this conversation is a lot of people think of AI, they have sort of a picture in their head and I'm gonna hopefully reshape that today. Um, but to uh, again, kind of reset and sort of start off a little bit of my background that is uh, in, in a little bit more context than my bio, um, just to first formally introduce myself. My name is Natalie Egan. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the CEO and founder of Translator. Um, and um, by way of background, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been starting businesses since I was a little kid, as Sari mentioned. Um, uh, this is my second major venture capital backed uh, HR technology, what I call change management software business, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit. Um, but prior to my transition and, uh, and prior to Translator, I did have another company uh, called PeopleLinks, which I built up, um, you know, raised a bunch of venture capital, you know, grew it from three employees to 50 employees in 18 months. Um, and everybody thought, you know, it looked like a unicorn for a little while and it all came crashing down. Um, and, you know, hindsight's always 2020. I couldn't see this at the time, but as I reflect on it, you know, culture was probably one of the biggest uh, problems, one of the biggest challenges with that organization. Um, if I had to describe my personal brand before my transition, I'd tell you it was toxic masculinity. Um, if I had to, you know, and then by default, you know, the sort of company culture was basically a frat house. Like think of it as like, you know, Brotopia. Um, and that was being rewarded at the time. That was what people wanted. Silicon Valley was rewarding that, you know, it was a sales culture. Um, but ultimately that was the downfall of that company. Um, and, uh, in 2016, when that, after that company kind of came crashing down, um, and my, my personal life, uh, came crashing down with it, um, I, and I thought my life could get no worse, by the way, um, that's when I figured out my truth and when I figured out my identity um, that I had been repressing this my whole life, um, you know, and I ended up coming out as a trans woman in 2016. What I always tell people is I experienced bias, discrimination and hatred for the first time in my life. You know, uh, academically and theoretically, I knew what those things were, but I had never experienced the sting of marginalization. You know, I'd never been, um, you know, I'd never been refused service. I had never been not looked in the eye. I'd never been talked over. Um, I'd never experienced any sort of physical or th psychological threat um, just for being me. Um, so it was a big eye-opening experience. Um, it, it still is. It's a journey. It's a, a journey that I am still on today. Um, but you know, what I experienced uh, was uh, was what I what I now know is, you know, is in my journey to becoming Natalie was also my journey to empathy. And and that was just sort of a byproduct of everything that I wasn't expecting. Um, what I what I quickly learned is that I had very little self-awareness prior to my transition. Um, I was sort of uh, born into a lot of privilege. Um, I knew I used the word privilege a lot. Um, but I didn't really know what it meant until it was effectively taken away from me. Um, now, I still have quite a bit of privilege. I realized that today. But at the time, I did, you know, I thought I lost all my privilege. Uh, woe is me sort of thing. But, you know, I realized even today as a white trans woman, um, and I still have a lot of the credentials I have, I still have quite a bit of privilege. Um, and I use that privilege to pay this all forward. So that's a big part of what you're going to see today. Um, I also confuse the word sympathy with empathy my whole life. Um, I actually thought they were interchangeable words, and now I have a much more keen understanding of, you know, sympathy is basically feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is the ability to walk in their shoes and uh, and to understand their lived experience, even if you haven't actually experienced what they've gone through, but it's the ability to connect to that person and connect to that experience. Um, and so what I effectively did was set out to build technology to help us understand each other better. 
Um, and very quickly, I realized that we can't understand each other better until we understand ourselves first. Thus, the idea of self-awareness, right? So effectively, what we started to build was self-awareness technology designed to help you understand your own identity and your own lived experience. And then that becomes a conduit or a gateway to learn about other people's identities and other people's lived experiences. So that's the journey I've been on for the last six or seven years. Um, it's been a pretty wild ride. Um, and um, and I'm excited to be here um, you know, presenting to you all today um, to kind of help you all potentially have hopefully some new understandings of how AI can help um, scale empathy, right? Was, which is really what we set out to do. Like the idea was how do we scale empathy through technology? And we hit some roadblocks along the way. Like we were learning and building and growing. And about two or three years ago, my, uh, my CTO, um, Josh Torres, said to me, uh, why don't we use AI here to solve this problem? And I said, that'll never work. Like I was sort of joking with him, but I just didn't think it would work. I didn't think there was, I didn't think that the, the way that he was talking about this fit the traditional mold of what AI was. And I also um, just sort of was a skeptic, but I said, you know what, let's go ahead and try it. So that's what we did. Um, and, you know, over the last two to three years, we've been developing this concept. As I mentioned earlier, it's very different than what you're probably expecting. And that's the purpose of today, right? So I think every, like we saw, I saw all these pre-submitted questions basically tied to an old, old, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say old, older way or old school, but just a more traditional way of thinking about AI. And what I'll tell you is that people think of AI as generative. They think of it as a chat GPT. They think of it as something that they can interact with in real time. And that's not necessarily the case all the time. Um, so I want to draw a distinction for everybody here uh, in thinking about AI, like more, you know, there's probably some more nuances to this, but at a high level, there's kind of two categories. There's AI powered, which would be like a chat GPT type of situation where you're like actually interacting with the technology in real time. There's a lot of other versions of that. They have to build very complex models to make them work. The models are ultimately mostly flawed uh, because humans are building them and you know they have inherently have biases. Um, so AI powered is a category. There is a new category that's sort of being sort of segmented or separated called AI enabled. Right, an AI enabled, like an AI powered, like the separation is not really for the end user to think about as much, as much to be honest, as maybe like investors might want to be able to think about, like how are you using as a company using AI? So we create a distinction and say, we use AI enabled, like our platform is AI enabled, uh, which does create a different um, experience uh, and it allows for, things that were never possible before to become possible. And one of those things for us was how to scale our platform. Like, so to give you a little bit of background on, on our company translator um, and, and a little bit more background on my, like of, of my background, just to give you a little color, uh, my previous business uh, people links, which is the one that went crash, like went straight up and then came crashing down. Uh, was a social media guidance tool. It was designed to show people what to do on social media at scale. Um, and uh, it was sort of built off the LinkedIn platform. Um, it was a, effectively a LinkedIn app and it would show you what to do in your job for LinkedIn, you know, or for, you know, on LinkedIn, you know, what to put on your profile, who to connect with, what to share. Uh, it was an early concept. I used to work for LinkedIn. They left LinkedIn to start this company. But before we started using that technology, it was actually just a training company. So I left LinkedIn in 2008 to start a LinkedIn training company to teach companies and the people within those companies how to use LinkedIn. Eventually, we started to add technology and scale it to what it became, which is when we raised venture capital and scaled it up. Um, this time around, I took a very similar kind of uh, strategy. Um, as I started to build DEI technology, I was not an expert in DEI. If you kind of remember my background, I was... I was kind of, uh, I was very much tone deaf. I didn't understand diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and I knew I needed to become a subject matter expert on it in order for us to do what I wanted to do. Um, so what I did is I went out and I hired some DEI consultants uh, and basically said, uh, I'm going to go sell some training deals and I want you to deliver the training and I'm going to study the training and watch for opportunities to insert technology into the training. 
So that's what we started doing about six or seven years ago. And we, for to a lot of people, we looked like a training company, understandably so. Um, but over time, we look like a training company with a product. What we were really doing is incubating a product inside that training company and sort of eventually going to launch that as a SaaS product that we could share with the world. Um, it took a lot longer than we expected. A lot of that has to do with um, my, my identity and challenges in the market, you know, trying to build this business focused on DEI. People were, um, you know, skeptical to say the least. Um, so we had to kind of keep grinding and we used client revenues from our training business to fund the development of the product. And that's what I'm going to show you here today to hopefully, again, alter not only how you think about AI, but also maybe potentially how you think about your own identity and your own lived experience, as well as the identities and lived experiences of others. So the idea is that we're going to use this technology to connect us to ourselves and connect us to each other. Um, so that's a little bit of like the context and background of what I'm about to show you here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, and sort of take you on a little bit of a journey here just to give you context as to what this is that you're about to do. Um, I am a salesperson by trade, um, so I oftentimes sound like I'm selling things. I really don't want you all to think about that, but I do have to give you context in order for you to be able to do the experience here. Um, and so that's what this is. Um, and I and I just want to sort of set the, the tone or set the stage. So we call this an AI enabled live learning platform um, with train the trainer as a service. That probably doesn't mean very much to you at the moment. Um, but what I'm going to sort of do is parse that up real quick. And then I'm going to get to the product and the platform. Um, but live learning, and I've already created the first distinction around AI enabled versus AI powered, right? So this is AI enabled. It means it's a got AI running in the background that's designed to help it do things that we could previously not do at all, which, you know, the, 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 the world of possibilities there is big, right? So how you all are thinking about AI, use this to kind of say, what else is there that we could possibly be doing? Um, so the second distinction I want to create is, you know, what is live learning, right? So live learning is a category that is forming. There's a lot of innovation in this space. Uh, a lot of startups are kind of trying to work on this idea of, of bringing people together to learn in cohorts rather than learn asynchronously. So we kind of been working on that for quite some time. Um, and there's a lot of activity in this space. We believe we're different for a lot of reasons especially this concept we call train the trainer as a service, which I'm not going to go into detail on today, but that is probably one of the biggest distinctions that makes us different in the space. Um, so now that I've sort of created some of these distinctions up front, I want you to kind of put that to the side. We'll come back to it. And for now, just think of us as the cure for lonely learning, right? This is part of the problem we're trying to solve with AI is how do we get people to connect uh, and, you know, in community to learn peer to peer rather than learn in isolation, right? The Surgeon General just declared loneliness an epidemic, you know, posing a more, you know, more deadly threat than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. And effectively, what we're trying to say is people don't want that anymore. Maybe before COVID, it was acceptable and maybe preferred by some people so they could go off and, um, you know, pretend to be watching a video while they actually do their email and click next or, you know, try and guess at the answers. That was like, okay, now I think, you know, post COVID people don't want that anymore. Um, so this is what we do, right? So um, to kind of get to the specifics here, we use avatars to co-teach live classes with the human facilitator. So the avatar, which is generated by an AI is basically an assistant that's gonna help you or help someone in your organization teach classes. Um, so that's basically what we've done is we've applied the AI to this like secondary concept or secondary role. It still requires a human to, to deliver the classes. And the, the thing that I underline is probably the most important. What I usually want people to focus on is we're democratizing access to live facilitated classes, right? That have been traditionally potentially reserved for small groups of people or the executive team, not necessarily the whole company. And what that does for our clients is it helps them cut training costs, improve workplace culture, and measure the results. Those are a little salesy, so I'm not going to get into them, but I want to show you how we actually do this. So if this was a session, right, let's say that, um, you know, we all work for a company, um, you know, let's say, uh, I was going to say X Corp, but that sounds like uh, 
the new Twitter company. Uh, so I'm going to say like uh, ABC company, right? So we all work for ABC company. And a few of our employees have gone through the train the trainer program, which is a very short certification program that allows for employees inside of ABC to deliver these trainings. Um, once they complete the certification, they have the ability to deliver any training in the platform because the avatar is going to assist them. So they don't need to become a subject matter expert anymore. Right. So that that's the whole kind of principle here. But I'll give you a little bit more detail. So let's say one of those humans is uh, this woman right here, Jade. So Jade has gone through the train the trainer program and now they can um, gather cohorts online, usually of about 25 to 50 people. You can do more and you can do less, uh, but usually 25 to 50 people is kind of the sweet spot. Um, and inside that audience, uh, or, or, or sorry, that audience can be gathered in Zoom or Teams, it doesn't matter. Um, so once the, the people have gathered, let's say it's two o'clock on a, on a Tuesday kind of thing, um, they're going to share the facilitator dashboard, which is just half of their screen with the audience. Inside the facilitator dashboard is your digital co-facilitator. So we use an AI to create this avatar. This avatar sometimes was known as what's called a deep fake. Right, so you all may recognize that term deep fake technology, maybe six, seven years ago, it came out and scared everybody because they were showing, um, you know, images of then President Obama, or maybe that was, I guess, a little bit longer before the Trump administration. So, uh, but, you know, President Obama at the time saying things that he wasn't really saying, and it looked so lifelike, right, it was really scary. Um, what's happened is this has been commercialized as a kind of, uh, you know, an AI for good um, or an AI for training is one way to think about it. So we use deep fakes or synthetic media is what it's really called today um, to help create a digital co-facilitator that's going to assist an employee inside this organization to deliver trainings. Um, so we're just going to show you that live in a second. You're actually going to participate in a training and then we're going to have the chat part. So I know a lot of you have questions. Um, we're going to have a discussion. Um, we're actually going to like experience the exercise, have a discussion around that, and then we'll do Q&A just to kind of set the, the agenda a little bit more firmly for folks that's wondering what's going on. But uh, in the session, in a training session, the avatar has a very specific role, right? It's a scripted experience. They deliver the same training every single time. Um, it is not generative. You don't ask it questions. We are building a version of that in the future. We're using this as a model to actually build the muscle to be able to do that. But without doing this, we can't teach the system, right? So this is like a stopgap to actually a future where what everybody wanted to be possible right now would be possible. But I'm telling you right now, the models can't handle what people are saying that they could potentially do when you start to think about like, oh, can AI just teach me empathy on the fly or just can I talk to it and have it teach me things? Uh, it's just too limited in its scope. So we're using this to teach that model long term. But in the near term, the AI has a very specific script that they follow. It's text to speech technology. So I can load in a script and it will speak it out loud and it looks incredibly lifelike. Uh, we can switch out the avatar and make it an Asian woman or a non-binary Hispanic man or non sorry non-binary Hispanic individual. Um, we can change the language that they speak. And then obviously we can update what they say in real time. So as the world changes, right, as things, you know, the, as, as, as the markets change, the, the world of DEI changes, sometimes the concepts change, right? So we can do that now without having to bring this particular actor who, you know, is a human that was put in front of a green screen wearing this shirt and, you know, speaking a certain way. We don't have to bring them back in and put them back and get the exact shirt and exact lighting and redo editing. We can do it on the fly. So it's very fast for us to spin up workshops and customize the workshops. So that is the application of AI that my CTO brought in about two or three years ago. Um, we've been testing it for quite some time, perfecting it, and it's uh, and it's wild how uh, how uh, the the effectiveness of this is. Um, so they have a role; they have a very specific role. They're gonna they're gonna deliver curriculum. They're gonna deliver exercises, which you're gonna do here in a minute, and then they're gonna prompt questions to help facilitate the conversation. So that's their role, but the human still has their role. So the human has a hidden teleprompter on the right-hand side, which the audience cannot see, that tells them what to say and when to say it. They can go off script a little bit, but not very much because the script is synced with the avatar script. 
So that does a lot of things, increasing like you know, increasing the consistency of the training, all kinds of good stuff, feature benefits. I won't go in today because I want to actually get to the platform. But one of the big things is the consistency. The other is that it allows for me to do this without having to become a subject matter expert and without burning me out as a facilitator, because the avatar is going to deliver, you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80% of the curriculum. But in any given training, it's only about 45%. Um, you know, curriculum and the other, or sorry, 50% curriculum and 50% like conversation between folks like you are, you all are learning from each other, sharing stories prompted by the avatar and the experience. So that's how it works high level um, with the, with the facilitator dashboard. At some point during the training, the avatar is going to say, take out your smartphone and scan this QR code. And it's going to drop you into an interactive kind of uh, anonymous web-based app where you can, uh, you know, participate with the training uh, without having to out yourself or otherize yourself by speaking out loud or raising your hand. Um, or if you were doing some of this stuff in person and you know diversity, equity, inclusion, a lot of the exercises that used to be done in person would require stepping forward if both your parents went to college or st stick a sticky note on the wall if you agree with a statement, um, you know, or you know, fill out this form or turn to your neighbor and complete the sentence. And you may not want to do that, right? Because of all kinds of reasons. Uh, one of the worst offenders that we quickly saw was raise your hand if you have a question, right? Like I was sitting there in a, in a DEI training seven years ago, watching and thinking, well, how many people in here are not asking the questions that they really have? Now, the facilitator had taken a little eight, a three by five index card and handed them out to people and said, if you have anonymous questions, you can write them on the, the index card and then like hand them to me kind of thing. And like that takes away all the anonymity of it, right? And in this particular situation, they had to hand it down a row because it was theater style seating, right? So people weren't asking those questions and we were saying, how do we, how do we like, you know, insert technology here? How do we do digital transformation for these trainings? So we launched these interactive exercises that allows for people to do them privately and anonymously from, you know, from the security and safety of their own home. Or if they're in a group of people in a conference room, at least they're doing it on their phone and no one can tell how they're answering the questions. So it's a little bit like Mentimeter or any of the other audience like polling tools that are free. The biggest difference is you can't just go in and change the questions. And we apply a very specific interface to gamify it that allows for a kind of more in-depth experience. So we're actually going to do one of those in a second. Um, the avatar is going to actually introduce it and launch it. Um, but once they do an exercise in the session, the avatar is going to take that information and redisplay aggregate information to you in real time so you can see it to help prompt the conversation. And then in this case, the, the avatar's name is Sean. Sean's going to say, here's three questions to think about, and I'm going to turn it over to your live facilitator to see if you have any questions or, or sorry, to, to facilitate the conversation. So that's the role that the human plays. Right. So we still need a human. They do the interactive part. They validate people's experiences and they basically surface that information and move on so that people feel seen, heard, you know, by the organization. Right. And that's a big part of DEI. Right. That's a big part of the whole part of feeling included is that I got to share my experience. Um, so that's how the experience for you all, what we're about to do here in a mini session. Um, after the sessions are over, there's a ton of data that comes out of this, which we are using AI and machine learning to then find trends and, you know, do all kinds of cool things to serve you insights to tell you, hey, I don't know if you realize this, but, you know, 70% of the Black women in your organization in, you know, mid-management and above are experiencing these specific stereotypes and labels. Right, that type of trending information, that type of uh, data on the backside, we are also applying a lot of AI machine learning techniques to. Uh, but that's how we're using AI in this particular situation. Hopefully, this is opening up some people's eyes to like how AI can work um, and how we are scaling access to these trainings so that the good work that facilitators are doing, anyways, can now be scaled and measured for very cost effective, uh, you know, and consistency. So that's the, the platform. Um, I'm gonna jump over now to the actual experience. Uh, so this is a live experience. Um, so if I worked for ABC Corp uh, and I um, had gone through the train the trainer program, uh, I would share my dashboard, which is what you all can see here. Um, and I would say, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. My name's Natalie. You know, my pronouns are she and hers. And we've got a lot to cover today. So I'm actually gonna turn it over to Lauren 
my digital co-facilitator to help explain what we're going to do today. So and then I introduced Lauren. So this is Lauren. This is the deep fake that our synthetic media, excuse me, I shouldn't have said deep fake, but the synthetic media that I introduced earlier. Um, and I'm going to let her do her little vignette here, which is about two minutes long, but I'm going to let you kind of experience uh, this, uh, this, this part of the, the platform. Hi, everyone. My name is Lauren. My pronouns are she and hers. And today I am your digital co-facilitator with Translator. If you are not familiar with Translator, we use safe space technology to deliver digital social learning experiences designed to help you grow and ask questions, all while protecting each person's identity. We are about to do our first interactive online exercise called the Stereotype Mask. But before we do that, I need to go over a few important points. We're going to be using the Translator platform for this learning experience. As you see on the screen, you can access the platform by going to www.join.host and entering today's unique PIN. The scannable QR code will also take you directly into today's learning experience. Once you've entered the PIN, you'll find yourself on a hold screen, which is right where you want to be. We recommend that you log into the platform from your smartphone. If you prefer to use a larger screen for accessibility purposes, you can also open another tab or browser window on your computer to toggle back and forth during this session. Either way, we ask that you use Chrome or Safari to log on. Okay, back to your live facilitator to make sure everyone is good to go. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and then this is my moment where I check in with people to see if they have questions, if they have trouble logging in. I can see participants logging in up here on the top right-hand corner. Um, so uh, about nine people have logged in, which is great. There's 10. Um, so it's, again, completely anonymous. Um, if you want, you can put your phone in private browsing mode. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you really want to um, make sure that we are not tracking you, but we don't cookie your phones um, and we have no information about you at all. So it really is a safe space um, for you to, you know, reflect on your own identity and your own lived experience, as well as the identities and lived experiences of others without fear and judgment of otherization. So normally what happened here, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to move us a little bit faster through this, but when I hit next, Lauren would come back here and start to the, get like get you logged on to, to do the actual exercise itself. So I'm just going to give you a little bit more of a demo view of this. Um, you know, she gives it more as a, um, uh, you know, kind of, a, you know, a, a two minute straight forward, but I'm going to give a little bit more storytelling behind it. Um, so what Lauren's going to do is basically get you ready to do the exercise. I'm going to give you a little bit of that orientation here. Um, in the bottom right hand corner of your of your screen, if you're logged in and see this screen, is this little yellow button that is an anonymous chat feature. So it allows for you to you know share what you know questions, to ask questions, to disagree, to you know add some flavor that no one else had thought of. Maybe you didn't want to speak it out loud. Maybe we we're running out of time. Maybe you thought of it 20 minutes later and you didn't want to interrupt the conversation push this yellow button and you can share it at any time. And it's going to be shared with me and only me, your facilitator, anonymously through a middleware that de-identifies your text. So I'm going to get a text on my cell phone that says, you know, it's from a 917 number and says, here's another comment from this unique session 2941. So it allows for you to, you know, really you know, participate in ways that you may not have felt comfortable before. So I'd encourage you all to use that. You can also use the Zoom chat if you'd like and chat uh, with Sari and the Power to Fly team. They'll collect questions and share them as well there. But if you chat through here, it also comes into the platform uh, so I can see it. And what's really important and why we encourage people to participate through this is because even if we don't get to address your specific question or concern or whatever it is you've shared, it is now part of the, the data that we can review with the management team afterwards. Um, so it's very important for that we tell people, if you want to provide feedback, even if you don't like this, this is your way to do it. Um, so that's the little yellow button. She explains it a little bit more succinctly than I do because um, you know she's uh, just kind of trying to get people onto the platform. Uh, but I'm also gonna show you the actual exercise that we're about to do. So uh, this is the exercise that we're about to do called the stereotype mask. It's been around for about 20 years. Um, it you before before 
uh, we digitized it. It used to look just like this. So an, a, a facilitator would pass out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with a number two pencil. And on one side of that piece of paper was this sort of Mardi Gras looking mask. And if you fl flipped it over on the other side is like a Mardi Gras looking mask. There's no instructions. And the facilitator would say on one side of this paper, I want you to write inside the mask all of the stereotypes and labels that you can think of that you experience in your life. You know, whether it's currently or in the past, just free flow, you know, write those words down. Um, now, Lauren here would define what a stereotype and a label is, which I will do in just a second. Um, but uh, once that example, or once that part of the uh, experience is over, you would flip the piece of paper over. And on the other side, inside the mask, you'd write the words to describe your authentic self, which interestingly is oftentimes the opposite of a stereotype and a label, right? So I'll share my own experience doing this seven years ago on a piece of paper, just to be vulnerable and share with you all and give you maybe some ideas um, about what you could be writing here. So I did this, um, I'd never done anything like it. It was actually one of the first DEI exercises I ever did. And the first word that came to mind was pervert. The second word that came to mind was mentally ill. And the third thing that I thought of was that people just think of me as that I'm really just a gay man, like a very gay man. <laughs> like those were the first three things that came to mind. And I wrote down a few others and I was brought to tears, not because I had never thought of those things, but because I'd actually never written them down on a piece of paper and looked at them. It's like looking in the mirror, right? It's very kind of challenging experience. Um, so everybody in the room did that. And then we flipped the piece of paper over and we wrote the words to describe our authentic self. For me, those words were silly and loving and gentle and nurturing and maternal, right? Like those were the types of words that I wrote down. And that felt really good. That felt like, wow, this is who I really am. Now, everybody else in the room did that. We only had about five minutes to discuss the exercise um, because it, you know, we were running over on time. And so the facilitator said, now I'd like to hear from two or three people, what words did you write? And one person stood up and not only took the five whole five minutes, but they kept going, right? And we had to sort of give them the platform and it was great for them to share, but we didn't get to hear from everybody else. And I found out afterwards, sort of unfortunately, but you know, as, as kind of can be the case, that same person is always the same person that's very vocal, which is great. We need to have vocal people in the organization, but we didn't get to hear from everybody else, which was kind of a big missed opportunity. And basically all those pieces of paper ended up in the trash. So what we've done is we've digitized it, obviously. Um, this is what it's going to look like on your phone in just a second. Um, it looks like this. So it's going to say, please share at least three stereotypes or labels that you experience. Um, these are words that we put in as examples. You're going to put your own words in and effectively create a word bank here. So as you hit the plus button, it's going to add it to your word bank. If you don't like the word or you misspell it, you can just hit the negative button. It'll take it away. Um, but when you're done and you have enough words, at least three, you hit the submit button and it will submit it into the platform. Uh, once you've done that, it'll ask you for at least three authentic words uh, to help um, uh, that you have to put into the platform. Uh, so that's how the, that all works. Uh, let me just quickly define a stereotype and a label for you. I'm just going to jump forward again. Um, and you can see she's saying this is easy for some people, much harder for others. If I hit play, she would explain this stuff to you. But again, I just wanted to do it quickly as, as, or with a little bit of a, a, a you know, a, this webinar type of view on this. Uh, but we are going to have a facilitated discussion afterwards. Um, so that's the that's how this works. Um, I'm going to let you all do it now here. Um, and by the way, just a, a stereotype and a label. So we all experience stereotypes and labels. Um, some of us experience more than others. Uh, uh, I would say quickly, a label uh, is is a labels are really useful, but they're just not great for people, right? So I'm a white person, a white woman, a white trans woman. Uh, but if you labeled me as a white woman, I wouldn't probably push back. I would self-identify as a white woman, a white trans woman. But if you stereotype me as a white woman, that's when I start to get a little uncomfortable, right? So labels are really good. For, I would say labels are good for things like rocks, right? <laughs> you know, you can label a rock you know, a rock and put it in a drawer and the rock's not going to say, but I'm more than a rock or, hey, you've mislabeled me. Um, but a stereotype is sort of a byproduct of labels gone wrong, right? So stereotypes are when labels start to bring in more negative things um, that may be related to a bigger narrative. Um, and stereotypes can be very, very damaging. Um, so oftentimes labels lead to stereotypes. Um, so if we are not careful with our language, which is a big point of this exercise, 
um, you know, we can quickly follow that slippery slope. So I'm going to hit the next button. It's going to cue everybody's phones to do the actual exercise. So everybody's phone should have just updated to the actual exercise. And what I'm going to ask now is that you just take a few minutes to, to write some of the stereotypes and labels in that you've experienced in your life. Um, just write free form, whatever comes to mind, speak your truth. Um, and uh, we'll see those words coming in in real time as people submit them. So I'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, and then we're going to uh, move on with this exercise and open it up to a group discussion. Hey, uh, Taro says, I don't see what you're sharing on your screen. Mine's on mine. It says, welcome, friends. Please wait for instructions from your host. Carol, I tried refreshing um, and that helped. I was about to say refreshing like solves almost all problems. If you're still having a problem, try opening the web browser on your on your computer. And for those of you that have completed, if you want to sort of reflect on like how this is making you feel or what this is bringing up for you, um, we are going to have a group discussion in just a minute or two. So I'll give you another minute. If you haven't finished, that's all right. You can still add your words, but um, I'm just gonna keep this going so that we can get to the discussion part. Great. So I'm going to hit the next button here. If you haven't finished, that's totally okay, because it's still going to collect your words. It's going to add them to this like display view that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, but you can see here, just with 11 completions, we've already collected 45 stereotypes and 38 authentic words. And it's always interesting because there's always more stereotypes than authentic words, right? Because it's easy probably for us to think of all the words that other people think of us. It's a little bit more challenging uh, potentially to describe how you are or how you see yourself. Um, so I'm going to hit next. And again, if you haven't finished, that's totally okay. It's good. You can still add them. But you're going to see here that we start to create this uh, sort of modified word cloud that's going to show you in real time the, the the stereotypes and labels that this particular group of people is 
experiencing. Um, so imagine if you have more people, uh, we had a little bit more time, I would have given you a couple more minutes, you'd start to see even more words on this page. And my role here as the live facilitator is to read these words out loud, right? To speak them into existence, right? And you see the, the numbers here indicate the number of times that word was used. Um, so you see right off the bat, the word fat was used three times, right? Aggressive twice, um, nerd twice, quiet, less than, awkward, lazy, white, annoying, spacey, Jewish, woman, uh, peacemaker, stupid, right? As I paginate to the right, you see more words like has been, less than again, weak, bossy, mean. There might've been, a, oh, that's spelled a little differently than my other one. Uh, weirdo, flighty, antagonistic, or antagonistic, not capable, foreigner, Luddite, unempathetic, you know, too direct, sissy, um, racist, defective, overly ambitious, X'd out from the world, tough, angry white woman, crazy, privileged, loud, uneducated, wealthy, hated, emotional, right? So this is like heavy, right? And this is just a small sample set of folks. And, you know, if I refresh this, it would add the next set of words that have been coming in. But you can imagine, you know, bringing a cohort of people together and having this experience, especially if people are working together. Um, and, you know, this really can sort of, you know, make people say to themselves, like, wow, who has to deal with these things, you know, in my organization? I feel like we know everybody who's being stereotyped as a terrorist or a thug or lazy or, you know, whatever it is that they're dealing with. So it's a great opportunity to see yourself and also to see others in a way that you may not have seen it. People don't necessarily feel comfortable saying this, how they feel like they're perceived in the workplace. What I'm gonna do now is flip that over, like as if we we're flipping that piece of paper over to show you like, this is the authentic words. This is who people, this is how we self-identify. This is who we really are. And it's often the opposite of the stereotype words. And we can do some really cool analysis on that, right? We can look at the user ID, which is anonymous, but we can see like this user put these words in as the stereotypes and these words in as the authentic words. And there's often a really interesting correlation between the words. I'll speak some of these out loud, right? Empathetic three times, kind twice, caring twice, hardworking, friendly, highly empathetic, creative, smart, valid, thoughtful, curious, tired, careful, tired is an authentic word. I thought that's interesting, right? Opinionated, reflective, um, questioning, learning mindset, funny, ambitious, active, evolving, introverted, right? They're actually introverted, right? If we looked at that, they might've been stereotyped as extroverted, but they're really introverted young at heart, silly, learner, healthy, adventurous, right? You can sort of get the theme here. Um, so this experience, as you now see the authentic words, oftentimes makes people go like, how do we tap into this, right? If this is who we really are, how do we leverage this as an organization? So as you kind of compare and contrast the stereotype words, people oftentimes here are looking at this saying, okay, this, this is hard, and how am I potentially part of the problem? right? Like, I don't mean to be because people are now sort of becoming more aware. And then how do we tap into who we really are? So the avatar comes back and says, you know, let's now talk about this. And here are the three questions, right? So there's a vignette here. Um, Lauren's going to say, you know, thank you for doing that exercise. I recognize this can be emotional and, you know, a little bit charged for people, but here are three questions to think about. So this is what I would like you all now to take yourself off mute, or I guess, I don't know if you can take yourself off mute, but you can share through the Zoom chat. You can share through the platform um, how this is making you feel, right? So I'm gonna take these words right now, or these uh, questions and just copy them and stop sharing. And I'm gonna put it through the platform uh, and just text it to everybody. Um, but how is this making you feel? Like what's coming up for you? Um, I don't know if, again, people can take themselves off mute. It looks like you can. I originally didn't think that you could, but uh, for anybody that wants to take themselves off mute and share out loud or turn on their video and share, I'd love to hear from you because I've been talking for quite a bit and I want to hear from you. Somebody just wrote in a comment. I can't believe I was just so honest with this AI platform. <laughs> so that's awesome, right? Like that's that is what we're tapping into in a lot of ways is the is the honesty of people, like their real lived experience, right? You know, and people will share things that will blow your mind through this, right? The that it's really powerful to connect people across differences because what we realize very quickly is that we're actually not that different, 
right? The things that we have in common with our other coworkers are oftentimes way below the surface. We don't bring it into the workplace, right? Uh, one of my favorite stories, because there's a lot of stories that get shared through this, is someone said in a session, uh, they took themselves off mute, they shared it out loud. They said, I've worked for this company for 20 years and I've never been able to talk about my identity or felt comfortable talking about my identity until this moment. And then they shared one of the most powerful stories I've ever heard. Uh, it was a black woman talking about her experience, um, having to commute and take like three different forms of public transportation to get to work, being held to the same standards and accountability of everybody else in the organization who's just walking down the street, like living in Manhattan. And it was hard, like it was hard for people to hear. And initially the management team was like, oh my gosh, because people were very emotional about it. They're like, we shouldn't have done this, right? Like we put this person in a bad position and, and you know, the, embarrassed them kind of thing. And in fact, it was the opposite. She felt seen and heard and validated in this environment for the first time. Um, and it's gone on to become like a really part of the cultural cornerstone of that organization in terms of how they're creating change is this transparency and letting people really, you know, show up as their authentic selves. Um, so thank you for for sharing that and, you know, uh, helping me kind of prompt some of that. Uh, another question that just came in just as questions are coming in. Um, someone's asked, you know, how long is this typical module? Um, today, they're mostly 90 minutes. Uh, you can extend them to 120 minutes. Um, to give you a little bit of background on the platform, we originally designed it for live in-person training pre-COVID. So before COVID, DEI trainings primarily were done in person and they were half day and full day workshops. Um, so we actually designed the technology to help augment in-person trainings because we didn't want people to have to raise their hand or step forward, you know, to do all the things in person. Um, so we were challenged by our clients in a COVID world to shorten the sessions. 90 minutes is, was kind of the, the format that we came up with, which people still think is a little bit long on the surface. But what we find is inevitably when we do these, people want them to be longer. So a 90 minute session can be extended to 120 minutes by simply extending the conversation parts of the training. So we usually reserve 20 minutes in a training for the first group conversation, and then another 20 minutes for the second group conversation, which gets queued up later. Um, so you can extend those uh, just, you know, just simply by just giving people more time to talk out loud. And we get an incredible amount of feedback through the platform that that's what people want. So we are continually, you know, updating and upgrading the platform with the feedback that people provide through the platform. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I have another uh, uh, chat that came in through the, uh, through the translator tool saying uh, that they just really appreciate the opportunity to, be, to have a safe space to share things that they wouldn't have shared otherwise. So thank you for sharing that. Someone else is talking about um, their sister uh, has a learning disability uh, that is a stigma that, that they um, oftentimes are unable to talk about um, and feel very uh, private about. And it's basically on the topic of neurodiversity, like related to mental health. Um, so one of the big things that comes out of the platform is a lot of insights into that mental health uh, sort of index of the organization, which again, we are applying you know, AI and machine learning to, to help you better understand what types of issues your employees are experiencing um, and which particular demographics in your organization are experiencing those. So at the end of every session, right? So uh, if we are wrapping this up right now, I would have everybody do what's called closing questions, which is the very end. Uh, it gives you the ability to share uh, anonymously, of course, uh, how you identify race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, status, et cetera. Uh, as well as kind of like other basic information, like a net promoter score. Um, you know, what did you think of the training? What did you think of the trainer? What, what would you like to see differently in your organization related to DEI efforts? So all that demographic ID we correct, connect, collect there, we tie to the uh, user IDs, which we, again, we protect. Uh, it's all anonymous. So we don't disclose any of that raw data to the client. But on the back end, we're going to be able to tell you very interesting insights about your employees, right? Like one thing that has really become very clear through our platform is that white women in particular are very comfortable talking about their mental health. Like they talk about it with each other. They talk about it pretty openly. They're very willing to go to the doctor um, and, you know, and, and, 
you know, talk about the, you know, the benefits of going to a doctor and medicine, where on the flip side, you know, people of color, in particular, black men, do not feel comfortable talking about mental health. They don't feel comfortable going to doctors. They don't feel comfortable disclosing it to their organization or talking about taking mental health days. So that's an insight that we pulled out of the platform that we will share back with our clients based on their organization, which oftentimes becomes a catalyst for change, right? Um, potentially uh, new programs, but oftentimes the remarketing of programs and the, the ability or the the uh, the initiatives to create more representation to destigmatize something like mental health for particular segments of the organization. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, prompting again that part of the discussion. Uh, does anybody else want to take themselves off mute and share out loud just so I'm not speaking? We've got a couple of minutes left. I think probably the biggest thing that I was trying to sort of uh, disrupt is what people are thinking in terms of like what AI is and how that can help us scale things that traditionally might not have been quite as scalable. Um, uh, there's a lot of different uses of these technologies out there. Um, obviously, this is just one of them, but there's a lot of activity in the space. So I really want to kind of uh, create some curiosity for people to start to go explore how other organizations are using AI in ways that aren't necessarily as obvious or as sort of a shiny as of an object of this idea that, you know, I'm going to interact with the AI in real time. Um, my CTO, if he was here, would just pretty much tell you flat out a lot of that stuff is canned or um, not canned as much as um, it's kind of built for demo. Uh, it doesn't actually work the way people are expecting it to work. We have a long ways to go for these models to basically truly understand like, like the human condition and what you know empathy is and how to respond. Um, you know, even though these sort of like ominous news articles are telling us that it's right here, um, I would just say there's other more practical uses of AI that are more near term that we can utilize right now. That would probably be my biggest takeaway.